Many human and non-human animals are the most psychologically intriguing of all interspecies relationships. These relations tend to be asymbiotic in nature, and more times than not, to the detriment of the non-human animal species, herein referred to as animals. Despite pervasive evidence of devastatingly inequitable relations between humans and animals, seemingly balanced allegiances have been forged between the two. The more considerate and unselfish human-animal interactions have resulted in the coining of the term human-animal bond. The term human-animal bond is defined by the American Veterinary Medical Association, ABMA, as the mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is influenced by behaviors that are essential to the health and well-being of both. In recent decades, attention has been directed to unveil the intricacies of the human-animal bond. An example of this is the recent emergence of anthrozoology, the study of human-animal relations. Yet following, clo yet following closely with historic custom and our species' tendency to exploit perceived vulnerability, Anthrozoology has come to focus much of its consideration on aspects of the human-animal bond which have potential for the greatest human benefit. Not surprisingly, an entire industry has emerged surrounding human-animal interactions deemed therapeutic for humans and has come to be known as animal-assisted therapy, or AAT. AAT is defined as the, as the presentation of an animal to one or more persons for the purpose of providing a beneficial impact on human health or well-being. The ABMA states that therapeutic programs involving animals are, quote, designed to promote improvement in human physical, social, emotional, or cognitive function. Yet both descriptions of AAT raise serious concerns as neither takes makes any mention or of the benefit or the potential risk to the animals involved. These explanations of AAT are grossly deficient in their failure to address or even acknowledge the ethical issues surrounding animal usage in therapeutic regime. Now just briefly, I wanted to touch on some of the kinds of animal-assisted therapy. Um, there's pet programs for the elderly, which just in, you know it encourages people to keep animals as pets or companion animals. Um, service animals guide dogs for the blind um, and hearing dogs for the deaf. And institutionally based residential so that would be like in prisons, nursing homes, psychiatric hospitals, the animals are actually living within these institutions. Um, the other kinds are visitation programs, which are definitely the most widespread, and that's where people volunteer their own companion animals. Um, to come and visit nursing homes, hospitals, private homes, etc. Equine riding programs or hippotherapy, and wild, non-domesticated animal programs. Um, these include dolphin swim programs and helper monkeys. <clears throat> so companion animals, namely the domesticated species of dogs and cats, provide obvious benefits for humans in the way of companionship. However, in addition to basic companionship, studies conducted on the effects of AAT programs have linked these human-animal interactions to a flurry of psychological and medicinal benefits for people. Some noted benefits include decreased anxiety, improved motor skills, increased self-esteem, and improved social interactions. Substantial cardiovascular benefits to humans have also been shown, including decrease in blood pressure and increased survival after heart attack. Companion animals also provide significant assistance in many crisis intervention and literacy development programs. The human benefits associated with AAT are unarguably numerous, yet we must not be so preoccupied with the benefits that we overlook our duty to the animals involved. We are obliged to consider thoroughly the ethical implications of animal involvement in therapy and treatment programs. In addition to the seemingly scarce concern for the animals involved, as exhibited by the very definition of AAT programs, there appear to be very few guidelines regulating these programs. 
Those guidelines that do exist are, in the majority of cases, self-regulated, and again, emphasize the safeguarding of human welfare. Regulatory shortfalls, coupled with the lack of in-depth ethical analysis within the actual AAT industry, prove very troublesome. It should come as no surprise that devastating ramifications for exploited individuals, in this case of AAT animals, arises whenever and wherever profit stands to be gained. Animal abuse, animal fatigue, and accidental injury are just a few of the risk factors associated with AAT programs. Thus far, I've briefly discussed the involvement of companion animals in AAT programs, but the use of undomesticated wild species is becoming more and more prevalent. Dolphin therapy programs and monkey assistance programs are two examples of AAT which utilizes wild animals and are debatably the most, debatably the most controversial form of animal-assisted therapy. Now, ca capuchin monkeys are the most common primate used to assist the day-to-day -day activities of physically disabled persons. As protocol, primates used in AAT are forcibly removed from their mothers shortly after birth and placed into foster care until the time they're able to begin training and assistance animals approximately six to eight weeks of age. The monkeys are trained using a variety of methods, which include sometimes include the use of electric shock. Some trainers have even noted that they use biting as a deterrent to bad behaviors since the mother in the wild would bite her offspring on the hand to show that um, a certain behavior should be discouraged. Now, primates serving in AAT capacity are also routinely undergo the extraction of all of their teeth. Um, rendering them non-threatening to their handlers. Now, these are just some pictures of the capuchin species in the wild. Um, and you can imagine they can swing and spend time with their families and learn all about what their natural behavior should be. But unfortunately, when they're taken away from their mothers, they have a very different understanding of their reality and who they are. And it's very confusing, obviously, for them. And some of them are even lucky enough to end up with people like Justin Bieber. <laughs> now this is the, this is like the facial profile of a, a capuchin, and this is what they can do even after their teeth have been removed. This again is an animal who has had their teeth removed, their canines in that, in that case in the, the hand picture. And so this is the procedure that they do to remove all the teeth. And that's a picture of what it looks like when all the teeth have been removed. <clears throat> now, primates serving in AAT capacity, um, they, they, you know, this is, this is the kind of life that they live. But also then, we see, um, I want to briefly talk about, oh, sorry, how do I go back? I want to briefly talk about um, the, the dolphins that are used. Um, Mark Beckloff um, noted in, in a 2000 um, piece that he wrote that captive, do do cap captive dolphins having repeated encounters with humans have enlarged adrenal glands and in indicating high levels of stress. And the adrenal glands are, of course, the ones that produce the stress hormone, cortisol. The graph to um, the right shows the actual levels and the, dif the difference in the weight of these glands. So at the point of death, um, many of the, many dolphins used in these programs have been necropsied and their adrenal glands are actually like double the size of a normal dolphin living in the wild. <clears throat> so it is of vital importance that we reconsider AAT programs taking into greater consideration the ethical implications of animal usage and exploitation. Doubtless, there are animals who do enjoy interaction with humans, yet clearly not all human-animal relations are advantageous to both parties. At the very least, a concerted effort ought to be made to formulate objective evaluation methods, which can be used to assess